Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of One Mic Night, the podcast that brings you stories of artists and people on their journey, helping to guide, answer questions, and motivate you in life and the business. I want to thank you guys all for being here. If you're watching on the podcast on YouTube, please make sure you give us a like if you like the content that I'm bringing. Also, you can give us some stars on Facebook and all those things to help support the podcast. I'm trying to bring you some great content and document beautiful stories and inspiring your life as well as mine. So please support the podcast any way you can. Today, I'm really, really excited. I say that every time, but today I'm especially excited. My guest today is an international best-selling author. She is the founder of Heartwork Emotional Empowerment Club. She is the host of Catch uh, Catch Some Sunshine podcast, Sunshine podcast, Soul Shine, Soul Shine podcast. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. And also, she describes herself as an angel mom. So we're gonna find out what all that stuff is. Please welcome Don Renee Beauvais to One Mic Night. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm Thank really excited you. to talk to you. Thank you for being here. Listen, I have questions. First right. question is, who is Don Renee Beauvais? So I like to describe myself as a seeker. Mm. I, I really have always been seeking, you know, to expand my life and bring hope, joy, and peace. So with that comes um, lots of self-healing modalities, um, healing modalities with other people to help me on this journey that we call life. I'm a lifelong learner. Um, at 45, I went back to school mm. and I got my master's degree. and And then after that... I decided I was, I'm a nurse and I decided oh, I really miss, I was teaching and I really miss working with people. So I went back to school again and got my nurse practitioner. And that second time, my husband was about ready to wring my neck because <laughs> I was also working, working full time. And, you know, I had kids in the home at that time and then going back to school. So it was a stressful time, but I, I'm so glad that I did. I pushed through and I did it because, you know, I really love what I do. I get to help a lot of people. That's a beautiful thing. And it's very hard to get to that point. But what I want to do is I want to kind of back up just a little bit. Where did, where did you grow up? Where are you, where are you from? So I'm um, <clears throat> from a little town in Ohio. And I tell people, a lot of people recognize Cedar Point and I'm 14 miles mm -hmm. from Cedar Point. We all know Cedar Point. Woo! <laughs> roller coasters. Yes. yes. The, yeah. So, yeah, I grew up here. I went to college in Columbus and I lived in Columbus for a while. It's where I met my husband. And he is from a really small rural town in Pennsylvania. And he really did not like the city. I really like the city, mm -hmm. but he didn't. So, I said, well, we don't have to live in Bellevue. Let's just go look around the lake area, see if there's something that you like. And he put out his resume and he ended up with a job in Bellevue. So I moved back here. Uh, my mom and my stepfather live here. My brother lives here. My sister lives in Columbus. So it's nice, but I do not like the cold winters. <laughs> well, I can believe that. I'm on the East Coast, so I know all about the uh, the cold weather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where did you get all of that? Everything you said in the beginning was, that's a lot. You know, yeah. and how do you get to a point where, you know, we always want to find the place where we can get to where we like what we're doing. We're passionate mm -hmm. about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But before you got to that point, where did where did that all come from? Were you always doing service Growing up, were you? Yeah, I think I'm a pretty service-oriented person. I really feel that that brings me a lot of peace and joy. But when I was in high school, I loved art. And I I actually took government in summer school mm -hmm. just to get it over with so that I could fit art into my schedule. So I 
And when I graduated, I had a choice. I could go to art school or I could go to nursing school. And the logical side of my brain, and I am learning, that's another thing I'm learning about myself. And I I had this girl that is a numerologist and she kind of did a little, you know, study on me and she goes, yeah, you really like security. And I'm like, <laughs> so true. I do. Yeah. So I chose nursing because I thought, well, you know, I like, I like helping people and I like that type of work, but the main reason was security. Sure. You know, I sure. knew I would have a job. I knew I wouldn't have to worry about it. So that's the field that I went into. And I have enjoyed that, that field. And I, I do like helping people, but you know, fast forward, I had four children and the first three were really close together. And then I had a little lull and then I had my, my last child and, you know, the opioid epidemic um, reaches far and wide and it hit my family mm. and my third child, Brad, um, got addicted to Percocet mm -hmm. and, um, he struggled. I mean, he, he went to rehab, he detoxed at home. I watched him do it and not many people can do that. And, um, eventually he ended up in Florida because we didn't know, you know, here's the thing about addiction. When somebody goes to the hospital and they have a heart attack or they have this life-threatening illness, they admit them or they find a specialist for them, they don't leave without some plan in place, Sure. right? Mm -hmm. When somebody goes to the hospital with addiction, they maybe revive them, may make them feel a little better, and then out the door they go. And that has gotten a little bit better over the last few years, but it's still a huge problem. And I lived it, you know? I, I didn't know where to send him. I didn't know what to do. So he right. went to Florida. My insurance ran out and he said, you know, mom, I'm, I'm not ready. And I said, okay, well, you know, let's find, can you find somewhere? And he found this halfway house in Florida. And, um, at that time, that was seven years ago, you know, there was no regulation on halfway houses. Anybody and I, I imagine probably that can still happen, could hang a shingle on their house and say, hey, this is a halfway house. Mm -hmm. Well, he ended up in one of those. And two weeks later, he overdosed in that halfway house, mm -hmm. along with two other people. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the techs that was working there, and then another young man overdosed. And from my understanding, it's no longer <laughs> in business, but... um. That was really, really hard because he had several months of recovery. I had my boy back, but he was like miles away from me. We were planning on seeing him at Christmas and we didn't, but, but I talked to him regularly and I'm grateful for that last few months, several months that he had in recovery because, you know, I knew that he loved us and he knew that we loved him and as tragic as it was, um, I have, again, as that lifelong seeker, learner, I've delved into lots of healing and writing, which comes to the, you know, the book. And I reignited my love and passion for art and started painting. And at first, that really wasn't something that I planned on making a little bit of business out of. But as I started sharing my art on social media, people started buying it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'll make a little business out of it. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a yes girl. So when opportunity comes, even if I'm scared, I I'll say yes. That's and beautiful. that's, that's why things that's, I feel like that's why I'm getting these opportunities. You're absolutely right. You hit the nail right on the head. You know, when we open ourselves for things to come, so many opportunities come our way. Right. We have to let down the fear. 
We're so yeah. fearful of what may happen. And we we talk about this because fear is something that we put on ourselves. We're fearful of being judged. We're fearful of what other people will think about what we're doing. And we have to take that, you know, security and just allow things to happen. I don't care what someone says about me. You know, if, you know, I'm not hurting anyone, but I'm allowing myself to be creative. I'm allowing myself to do some things that I probably wouldn't do. But so many opportunities come from that when you allow mm -hmm. yourself to, to be open. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm not going to say that everything I've said yes to has been a good decision. Right. No, of course. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had a kitchen fire. And so we had to, the insurance paid for us to get, do a new kitchen. So I bought these tile things and I thought, well, we can do this ourselves. And then I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. So I went to Lowe's to find a wet saw and, you know, get some um, stuff to put the tiles down. And there was this guy standing there and he goes, oh, you're putting in some tiles. I go, oh yeah. I said, I've never done it before, but I'm going to, we're going to try and he goes, oh, I've been doing tiles my whole life. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I, I put lay tiles everywhere. And I go, well, do you do any side jobs? And he goes, well, sure. I hired him. Uh huh. And my tiles <laughs> were like this. <laughs> and I actually had to say, stop. Like he put it in like a whole row. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? So I had to let him go. And then I had to hire somebody else to come in and fix it and redo it, which cost me more money. Wow. So, you know, not all of my yeses are good decisions. <laughs> right. But, you know, the lesson learned, you know, yeah. that comes out of it is what we have to, you know, keep close to us. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I understand yeah. that for sure. I want to um, kind of backtrack just a little bit about what you were saying about your son. You yes. mentioned he said um, he wasn't ready. Right. I know that, you know, I've had a similar experience in my own family, as mm -hmm. do most people. You know, yeah. we, the, our children, our, our brothers and sisters, our parents, you know, they're affected by, you know, drugs. Yeah. Um, same thing happened in my family. But I do mm -hmm. know that when, when they say they're not ready, they're not ready. Yeah. Because it's their mindset that has to change first. If you feel like you've reached the bottom or you feel like you want to make a change in your life, that's where it's going to happen. We're all hopeful. We want it. You know, we want the best. We want it to yeah. work out. But ultimately, if they're not ready, it's not going to change. Right. But we want to take them out of the environment that they're in to keep them away from where it started. Mm -hmm. But certainly you had no idea what was going on there. No. Absolutely not. You know, um, but yeah, if they're not ready, they're 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 not ready. You know, you look at the healthcare model for addiction and recovery, mm -hmm. and we'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on somebody to get heart surgery and all the aftercare. But with addiction and recovery, it's 30 days and then you're cured and they're not because right. of course I researched and dived into that. And, you know, the brain is so affected by the addiction process and all these new neural pathways that you've got to bypass and get your brain back to a state of health. And the research is clear. It takes nine to 12 months At for least, that to yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. It so, really I mean, he knew he wasn't ready, <laughs> but, insurance dictates and you know and I've learned a lot more since then um about long-term treatment places that he could have went and safe places but I think going backward and rehashing that and and I went through a lot of the what-ifs and the whys and you know I should have and could have but I've I've kind of let that go now and I've just accepted the fact that his journey on earth was complete and, and now he is, you know, in a place that, you know, you can refer to as heaven or 
you know, um, energy or whatever. People have different names for right. it. But, but he's, you know, energy doesn't die. Our right. souls don't die. We just go to another place. And although I miss his physical presence, um, I am at peace with the fact that he's good, you know. That's a beautiful place to be. And you can't hold yourself responsible. You'd be right. holding yourself hostage for the rest yeah. of your life. We have yeah. to allow that to go, you know, in order yeah. to proceed with our own lives. And as you mm -hmm. said, you know, if you believe that it's energy, energy doesn't stop. Energy is still yeah. here with me. You know, right. I right. think the same about my grandmother, who was, you know, uh, instrumental in the way that I live my life and what I do in service. You know, her energy is here. Right. as they pass on. So we can't hold ourselves hostage as much as we'd like them to be here and what we could have done to prevent or what we should have done. You know, we can't be responsible for that. We have to let it go and allow mm -hmm. that and know that there's a lesson to be learned from the whole experience. And as you sit here talking to me, sharing your story, this is part of the lesson and it helps other people. Right. You know? <clears throat> I've had um, a lot of tragedy in my lifetime, you know. Um, my dad died in a car accident a week before my senior year of college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was ex so excited for me to graduate because, like, I would be the first person in the family ever to go to college and graduate. And that was tough. And I thought that was the worst possible grief that I could ever experience. But I but it wasn't. And then, you know, after Brad passed away, we became very close to his sponsor who lost both of his parents to cancer and uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And he was just like a part of our family. And he had like five years of recovery. And then he had an awful breakup and um, he relapsed and he passed away. Hmm. And that hit me hard, but I worked through that. Um, and then last year, and I've just recently started talking about this because they say it's not really healthy to talk about your wounds when they're still open. You have to wait until you begin to heal a little bit from those wounds. And I have started to heal a little bit from this wound, but... Um, my oldest son had two children and um, he ended up with COVID. He was on a ventilator at Cleveland Clinic and came home and, you know, he just wasn't himself depressed and all that. And so I found a babysitter for him, for their kids. And about a year ago, um, I got the worst call of my life that Willie, the baby, he was almost two um, wasn't breathing and they revived him and he was at the ER and then they life flighted him to a larger hospital and, um, he was on the ventilator for several days, almost a week. And then, um, you know, he was brain dead. So, mm. uh, last week was the babysitter's trial because oh, she gosh. was charged for his death. And, I knew her. I did service work with her in the recovery community. Um, I don't believe she's a malicious person. I really don't. But I do believe she had a moment, perhaps a moment of frustration or anger or rage. And she shook him mm -hmm. and forever changed her life, our lives everyone that knew her, everyone that knew us and Willie. And, you know, I, I've come to this place of forgiveness for her and not everybody in my family is there yet. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we all reach, we all go through different phases of our recovery process, but I think because I have been such a seeker and I have done such internal work that it makes me um, realize that, you know, this, the saying, 
uh, resentment is like drinking poison mm -hmm. and expecting someone else to die. Right. And I don't have room for that in my life. Right. You know, yeah, I don't, I, I want to live happy, joyous, and free. So I'm not saying, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm perfect, that I haven't had thoughts, you know, but ultimately, um, I have compassion for her, you know, she's in prison now and yeah. Yeah. I think, excuse me. I think you, uh, you said it, you kind of have to figure out what you think justice is. You know, it doesn't have to be prison. It doesn't have to be life sentence. It doesn't have to be, it's what you feel in your heart. What that's a tough one. That's a really big introspective place to be in. Yeah. And nobody has the answer but you, right. you know, um, right. that's tough. That's a really tough one. It's been a tough one, but I have, you know, done a lot of soul searching and working through it. And, you know, just the realization that who am I harming right. if I carry this bitterness and resentment? And, you know, grief is tricky because there are some days that, you know, you're fine. And then there's other days where it's like smacking you right in the face. Right. And um, I've learned that I've gotten through those tough days a lot quicker now, you know? Yeah. And creativity has been key for me, you know? How so? How so? So after Brian, uh, Brad's sponsor, <clears throat> died... My sister, who did go to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, she called me up and she said, "She, I said, I just need to get away. Can I come to your house just for an escape, you know? And she said, yeah, come on. Well, you can spend the night. We'll do some fun things over the weekend. And and she goes, and we're going to paint. And I'm like, no, mm -mm, I'm not painting. And she's <laughs> like, yeah, you're going to paint. And I go, no, I'm not you know, two bowl heads right. against each other, right? <laughs> so I get there and she has her kitchen table all set up with paint and paint brushes and canvases. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll paint. So I sat down and um, Brian had this huge tattoo of a lion on his back. So I thought I'm going to paint a lion. And I painted this very colorful, abstract kind of lion with these fierce eyes and for two hours I sat or maybe three I don't even know I sat at that kitchen table painting and something clicked hmm. I realized that that was the first time that I had sat still for a, a lengthy amount of time and did something and felt really good Wow. And wow. I finished that painting session and I thought, huh, wow, I'm going to keep painting. So from there, you know, the learner that I am, I started taking, you know, some online courses and I learned about fluid art. And then I, you know, I started studying portraits and all kinds of stuff, collage. And I do creative stuff every day. And the one thing that I, I noticed is my granddaughter, she's five and, you know, she lost her baby brother. She spends a lot of time at our house and I got her painting and drawing and coloring and she loves it. So I think it's like the gift that you can keep giving, you know, any why, creative outlet. Yeah. Why do you think that's so important? I mean, even for, for a young child to do that. Why do you think that's important? Because our schools are not, you know, allowing us to 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 do that any longer. I know. Right? It makes absolutely yeah. no sense. There's so much research out that shows how creativity increases the neuroplasticity of the brain, which neuroplasticity is, you know, the growth of the brain. It creates new pathways and it helps with anxiety, depression, grief. I mean so much research and yet we're taking it out of the schools 
right. it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it's, it's not just with visual art. It's not just with music. It's with every field. You have yes. to be creative in every field. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and that's what I say. Creativity, <laughs> like for me, I like art. Um, my husband, he started on uh, knitting and crocheting. <laughs> and he loves it. He's made several blankets and um, things for people. And, you know, other people like singing. You are an actor. Right. So, I mean, anything that you're expressing yourself creatively, creatively, I don't know how to, creatively, creatively, <laughs> I couldn't get the word. Anything you're doing creatively um, is really helping you on an emotional, spiritual, physical, and mental mm -hmm. well being. Right. I mean, it helps with everything. And people say, well, how can you say art is helping you with physical? Well, when I am participating in a project, then I feel like being physical, right? Right. Yeah. So it does help. Right. It helps in every way. And it goes back to what we were talking about before with energy that doesn't stop. You're expressing yeah. and the energy is coming out of you yeah. in different ways, whether it's dance or visually or yeah. musically. You yes. know, when you're on stage, the energy that you feel on stage. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. expressing through energy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You mentioned your book earlier. Tell us a little bit about your book and what it's called. Okay. So I, um, I have a mentor for my art business and her name is Jessica Hughes. Um, I actually bought one of her paintings early on and then uh, she started this membership and I joined that. And she got about 60, give or takes around 60 artists or creatives together. And she said, hey, let's do this collaboration and do this book. And I'm like, okay. Because, you idea. know, I'm Great a yes idea. girl. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she wrote the first, she, she, she didn't write, we all contributed, but she put out that first book the creative life book and the day it was released on Amazon was crazy. I watched that book go from, okay, where they have all kinds of little categories in Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have big categories. We started taking down little category, little category, little category, we're at 10 categories, number one. We're at oh, 15 wow. categories, number one. Then we went to um, the top categories, number one. And then uh, internationally, we we hit like, I don't know, four countries international that it hit number one in. And I'm like, what is happening? What? What's yeah. resonating with people? What is it? What, what, what do you think happened? So it was really exp um, how creativity changes your life. And everybody contributed a chapter on some things that you can do creatively that have helped you and that can help other people. And they shared yeah. that in the book. And so then she decided, well, that one went so well, we're going to do another one. And the second one was the um, Radical Self-Love book. Mm. And it was so funny because I had just talked about and written about how you know loot having so many losses and tragedies really forces you to radically love yourself love yourself enough to make changes have growth do things that are going to make you better and feel better and then we we put out that book and she's going to be doing another one here real soon. So I don't know. Maybe you might want to be in that one. I might. I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know. But yeah, that <clears throat> one is going to be um, Radical Freedom. I have to say, <laughs> there's so much power in freedom. Yeah. So much power. Yeah. 
You know, as soon as you said that word, the first thing that came to my mind is just power, empowering yourself, being yeah. free. Yeah. You know, it comes from the introspection that you just talked about. If you're free to do something, it's so powerful. You don't care what other people say about you or think about you, you know, and then it starts to actually attract people, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Freedom is a, is a beautiful word. It's powerful. It is. It is. Yeah. I, um, uh, one of my other mentors and that helps has helped me so much. Um, Kent Coleman, he's in a recovery group and he was telling a story. I mean, he's spoken all over, you know, United States and really actually out of the country too. But he told the story of this man that was in prison and prison for life in solitary confinement. I don't know, maybe not solitary, but he was imprisoned for life and they went to interview him and he was just so at peace and happy. And they said, and he had found recovery, you know, cause he had a substance use problem. And mm -hmm. He said, freedom is in here. He said, I'm more free now in prison for the rest of my life than I ever was mm -hmm. when I was out there. Yeah, I believe that. Because it's an inside job. Yeah, it is an inside. You know, abundance, uh, all of that stuff is just mindset. Mindset. We talked about that earlier. Right. Mindset. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, a specialty area that you like to concentrate on when you're doing art? I've seen a lot of your videos and it's beautiful, you know, paintings. Well, first of all, um, I, I want to back up too, because a lot of yeah. your videos, I think that the most beautiful art comes when you incorporate multimedias. So the music that you choose that goes along with your videos just enhances the beauty of what you do. Some incredible stuff. Yeah. I really like my art to have an emotional connection. So, you know, I, I did a series of like the tree of life type series and one was divinely inspired and it had this gold ring around it. Um, the other one I, I called tree of hope, you know, barren bra branches and, uh, but yet these silver spiral, uh, things coming through. And then I did another one, the tree of abundantia. And that one was a lush and big, um, blooming tree with all kinds of different colors in it. And it kind of, to me was representative of, you know, seasons of life, right? You know, sometimes you have to look through the branches to see the hope, you know, the bare tree, uh, the tree of abundantia, uh, colorful and bright and beautiful, you know, just represents that that's all here for us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've recently gotten into portraits and, you know, I pick things that I have, I feel something with, like, you know, I did a portrait, I don't know if you saw it, of an uh, African-American woman, and she just, she was so beautiful, but yet she had this fierce look on her face. I like, did see it. I am power. Yeah. And that just resonated with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm doing uh, Stevie Nicks right now for somebody. I and. I love Stevie Nicks. I mean, why, she why do you love Stevie Nicks? I love Stevie Nicks too. But... You do? Yeah, I do actually. I yeah. I grew up listening to Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks, and Stevie is just that. Like when you talk about energy, I think of Stevie Nicks. You know, she just exudes that just powerful energy of love and compassion, and you know, I know she's had her trials in life too and not mm -hmm. perfect but it doesn't matter because she just she has this beauty and i think it's all about her energy 
Mm-hmm. And I love the songs. I love her voice. Yeah. I've seen her in concert. And she also embraces the energy that's around her supernaturally. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, sure does. Yeah. 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 I grew up on Fle- Fleetwood Mac too. So I know. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, where do we, do you have an exhibit or where can we go to see your art? So I have, um, I have a website, mm-hmm. dawnreneebovet.com, and I have my art listed there. And then I just kind of show it on Facebook and people reach out to me and, or Instagram and they'll, they'll purchase it. Um, I have, there's a little, um, gallery in my town, Art 106, that I have a few pieces in and, Oh, and if, if somebody wants a free print of the trees that I talked about, I do have a, you can get a five by seven print for free mm-hmm. and it's called, uh, that link is dawnbovayprints.com. You also give a little uh, meditation or affirmation with it too, don't you? Mm-hmm. I do. Why yeah. is that important to you? I'm telling you what, meditation is so important because it brings you back to that place of stillness. It calms the energy within. And I use this phrase a lot, but when we try and heal from trauma or events or grief or whatever, we're not bringing things in, right? Mm -hmm. What we're doing is removing all the stuff that's blocking us off from the sunlight of the spirit. That's what meditation does. Yes, yes. Gets rid of all that junk that you're carrying around. And it is so vitally important. Right. And changes your outlook on the way you see things. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. What else would you like us to know? Do you have something coming up soon that you want us to know about? Well, I just started. So I'm a giver. And I've done a lot of volunteer work and I've given a lot of art away. And then I had this idea, what if I started this ripple club where people could join and send me a digital uh, piece of their artwork or something that they want to promote. And I start putting it out into the world. And so I started the ripple club Hmm. um, and it's called the ripple experiment. And that is, uh, ripple.dawnreneebovet.com but the cool thing about that is my daughter lives in Asheville North Carolina have you ever been there never been there Mm -mm. you gotta go it is like when you talk about energy Mm -hmm. like it's in the Blue Ridge Mountains you can see the mountains Mm. all around it's a really um like hip uh I don't hipster type of hipster, uh, liberal, uh, easygoing type um, town. And I, and it's really an artsy community. So anyway, I took some of my five by sevens and I just started giving them to people. And when you see people open up a gift that you've given them and watch the expression, one woman said, oh my gosh, thank you. My mom was an artist. I'm going to frame this and hang it up. And it's really powerful because one, the the most important thing is I really do believe that like the true work, what truly karma is, is, you know, giving and receiving, being open to receive and what, how you perceive. Mm. That's really what karma is. People say, oh, karma is going to get them. Oh, no. That's bad karma, if you're saying that about people. Um, Karma, uh, Wayne Dwyer Dwyer used to say, um, others, uh, what karma is, oh gosh, I wish I could think of it. Something like um, how you respond to other people's behavior is what karma really is. Hmm. Something like that. Interesting. I messed it up. But it's it's really, really good food for thought. You know what I mean? Right. Which is always so anyway, powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Getting back to the ripple experiment, I started doing that. 
And I thought, well, what if I could get other people that want to, you know, put stuff out into the world and join this club. And then we all start putting this good stuff out into the world. And that's how I had the idea of the rebel club. That's beautiful. I love that. Art is made to be shared. Who wants yes. to be an artist and just create and nobody sees your art? Nobody yeah. share. You don't share your art. It's supposed to be shared. Right. It's supposed to, you know, tackle uh, injustices. It's supposed to tackle um, feelings, emotion, uh, uh, you know, provoke emotion, everything, mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to share. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for it's sure. Beautiful. Well, so tell us how, my, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's my biggest, that's, I think what's going on right now. And then, you know, I do the, the podcast and I can't wait for you to be a guest too. I can't wait either. <laughs> I do a lot of volunteer work for an organization called Ohio Can Change mm -hmm. Addiction Now. And it's really a grassroots uh, program started with two moms who had children that were, you know, uh, um, addicted to substances and it's become this huge organization all over the state of Ohio. In my region, we give um, what's called gifts of love. So we raise a lot of money and then for somebody that's in early recovery that needs to go to uh, sober living or a halfway house and they need, you know, some money to get started or We've given somebody steel-toed boots so they could start their job or, mm. you know, transportation money or money for gifts for Christmas for their kids because, you know, they don't have any money right now. Right. So we've helped a lot of people and um, <laughs> I love that organization. It does a lot of good. I think that's great. What do you think is the biggest problem that uh, people have in terms of substance abuse and following up and do you think it's a lack of money and a lack of resources, you know, to help people after care? I think that's part aftercare of it. Aftercare is important. Yeah, I think that's part of it. If you think about it, somebody that has been struggling, they don't have anything, right? right? Their existence is trying to feed their body with the substance so that they don't have horrible withdrawal or pain or whatever. So they're starting from nothing. Uh Many people have um, legal issues, you know, they don't have, they can't drive, their license has been revoked. Um, there's not a lot of living space for them to go after, you know, rehab or what have you. Right. Uh, maybe they don't want to go back to their old environment, which is in a safe environment. So right. there's just so many social economical problems that go with early recovery and I have seen people rebuild their lives but it's it's huge it's a huge problem and then they say well you know you got to throw yourself into recovery you got to do this well and then they have children that they have to take care of or they have to work and so it's it's challenging it's very challenging yeah mm -hmm. yeah well thank you for that uh information. I mean, I think it's important that people, like we said, have some sort of aftercare. So that organization is is one that sounds like it's helping people along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And well, uh, mm -hmm. that's about, and I still work as a nurse practitioner. Well, first of all, my hat goes off to all nurses. I've worked in situations with nurses. You do so much. Thank you for your service. for taking care of people with love and kindness and care. I went to a, uh, I worked with healing uh, the children organizations. Um, I went as a photographer to Colombia. Um, wow. And because I speak Spanish, by default, a lot of the doctors and nurses did not speak Spanish. So I was in the recovery room from the cleft palate surgeries. So I would stand there and hold people's hands and talk to them and, you know, comfort them. And there were people there without families. They would travel. It wasn't, it wasn't in a huge city in Colombia. It was in Villa Vicencio, which is way outside of uh, Bogota. So just the compassion that all the nurses had in doing the surgeries, we won for the most amount of surgeries ever done for Healing the Children organization. And talk about, you know, just the feeling you have of doing service and knowing that you're helping people um, around the world is incredible. So you, my hat goes off to all the nurses for that. So thank you for that. Yeah. 
I love that. You like I love that story. <laughs> really? Yes, yeah, I love that. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. So cool. Is there one link we can go to to find you or where should we go to find uh, and the other probably things. the the best link would be donreneebovee.com. donreneebovee.com. Everybody, yes. please make sure you go to donreneebovee.com. Check out the incredible artist and nurse known as Don Bove. Um, please come back to the show anytime. I want to like we'll keep in touch, and I want you to come back and update us with everything that's going on, especially with the new book. Thank you for joining me on One Mic Night. Everyone, all the notes will be down and the links to find Dawn will be down in the episode notes. If you like this episode, please, as I said, make sure you share the episode and you can find links to support us as well and support Dawn and her endeavors. My name is Marcos Luis, M-A-R-C-O-S-L-U-I-S. You can DM me, I'm on Instagram or all social media. Or you can follow the show at One Mike Night on YouTube. We will be streaming live on Facebook soon. I'm trying to get myself together and get there as well. So thank you for joining me for the show. We'll see you next time.